this, I think, fourth or fifth innovation talk, uh, public innovation talk at the Data Analytics Center at the Danish Medicine Agency. I'm really delighted uh, to once more to uh, welcome you here for one of our innovation talks, which is um, for initiatives, consortia, researchers, and regulatory governmental agencies ongoing work related to health data science, broadly determined, but really with the purpose to uh, raise awareness uh, of initiatives local and global related to life science broadly defined. Um, as long as we have health data and advanced analytics that are part of the topic, it can be featured here. So please bear that in mind if you are interested in participating. We really hope to foster interest and knowledge sharing about health data science innovation, uh, not only in the greater Copenhagen area, but uh, globally, uh, and also for the ability for initiatives to reach out to one another. Um, if you'd like to be featured in our talk series, uh, feel free to reach out to us at uh, Lars's email, uh, LARN at dkma.dk, uh, and then we'll definitely be reaching out to you. A simple disclaimer around this uh, event uh, presentations here are not endorsed by the Danish Medicines Agency, and it will not be possible to present a solely commercial offering. I'm very honored uh, to be able to welcome Søren Brunak here today for this uh, session we will have. Um, and the uh, purpose here will be for, for Søren to present uh, his enormous work around multi-step disease and prescription tra trajectories uh, in the understanding of human disease progression patterns and underlying molecular level etiologies. Um, Cern will present uh, his approaches around these trajectories and just a we're looking at here. Cern and his team uses data covering seven to ten million patients from Denmark. If you know our demographics, you know that's not the size of our population, it's actually a little smaller, but it actually covers the past 20 to 40 years and then condense that data into of the millions of individuals, uh, their trajectories into smaller sets of recurrent ones, really giving us a completely different understanding about the uh, subgroups and longitudinal phenotypes uh, that ba basically can inform us about differential treatment designs of relevance to those individual patients. Um, Cern is truly a pioneer in the biomedical sciences uh, through his innovation and the introduction of new computational strategies um, currently at the center for protein research at the University of Copenhagen, previously also internationally renowned for the Center for Biological uh, Sequence Analysis at DTU. Uh, and I think, so. And you have published close to 300 papers, international peer review of scientific journals, including some of the uh, top profile ones. Really, really uh, happy to have you here on this session today and uh, looking so much forward to uh, your presentation. Yeah, Over to you, thank sir. you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and, and uh, for the invitation. Here I will just share my my uh, my screen. Um, and um, it is uh, really an honor also to speak in this um, uh, program uh, because we are we are interested also in in uh, in feedback uh, uh, because we are uh, not uh, what I would call classical epidemiologists. I mean, we come more from the bioinformatics and the big data and the data science uh, area. So what we have been working on um, for the past um, uh, years, um, 10 years or so, is to, to look at diseases longitudinally um, and now also uh, prescription trajectories, as you will hear uh, about uh, later. Um, and, and in this way, we are sort of uh, disease agnostic and, and we are interested in, 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 in the longitudinal patterns uh, primarily. We also work on, on the raw patient record in many of our projects. So not just registry data, but of course, this is uh, easiest to get your hands on. Uh, raw patient record data might be more complicated and, uh, and we will also return to, to that. Um, so the idea is uh, illustrated uh, here. I mean, if we look into the Danish National Patient Registry, we will see all these ICD-10 codes for different um, uh, patients, and and we will see them um, in the in the ICD-10 system. And you see the color coding uh, that is one of the two color codings I will use to, uh, today. And I mean, basically, we're interested in in, in what is the systematics. 
in these trajectories if you follow people over 20 or 40 years. Uh, what is um, actually the, the patterns that we, we, uh, we see? And we are also interested in uh, trying to see whether we could redefine some uh, disease patterns because we are using the ICD system. It goes way back. Uh, but I mean, is the disease uh, for this um, uh, third uh, female here, these, these four diagnoses in a row, is that a disease or, or should it be broken down in, in a red reductionistic uh, way into the diagnosis? So we're also interested in, in looking at the etiology and, and, and um, seeing whether we actually could condense some of the codes into, into fewer um, um, trajectories that would represent diseases. And uh, as I said, I mean, ICD goes way uh, back, more than 100 uh, years. And, and of course, this will always be behind um, the disease development. We've seen this with, with um, uh, Corona and, and uh, COVID. Of course, these uh, codes, they got introduced in Denmark very fast uh, when WHO re re released them. But, but of course, the codes are behind um, uh, the, um, the sort of real uh, development. And um, um, in ICD, as you also know, uh, I mean, we got more and more codes. It started as a causes of death uh, system, uh, and then uh, more and more codes um, uh, came in over time. And, and soon we are looking to uh, ICD-11, where there will maybe be more than 50,000 uh, codes. So more and more fine grains. So our efforts is maybe also to try to see whether we can condense some of, of this. This is also a system that is used for payment in in, in, um, in healthcare. So it doesn't necessarily reflect disease etiology and, and, and mechanistic uh, aspects. Uh, but of course, the, the um, uh, data foundation uh, uh, our registry data for this type of trajectory uh, work, um, where we of course have to to interface different versions of ICD if we want to go uh, 40 years. Uh, we, it's not because the Danes suddenly got much more ill in in 94. It's because the ICD-10 had had more uh, codes in the in the Danish uh, version. So um, most of the work we have done, we have done in, in the ICD-10 era since 94, and the first paper here um, illustrates how we see the different code breakdown for females and males, for inpatients, outpatients, and emergency room patients. You, for example, see all the, the pregnancy-related codes to, to the left for the females. You also see chapter two, the brown chapter here, is kicking in earlier. But but we basically ask this question. We have, say, 7 million individual trajectories. Which are the most frequent ones? Which are the um, the um, uh, sort of highways in, in, in the disease space when we go across all the diagnosis? And here we we uh, see uh, ICD-10 level three. Of course, you can also go, go more uh, fine uh, grain. But we developed um, an approach to to uh, look into the statistics of this. And we should, of course, also remember also in the context of this talk that many of the diseases people get, at least some of them will be treatment provoked. If you get vaccinated, you might get some diseases you would not otherwise have, have gotten. If you get radiation therapy for your cancer might be different um, in terms of, of, of what complications you get uh, compared to if you you have have uh, chemotherapy and so on so 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 disentangling what is um, just uh, disease etiology and and interaction between diseases and 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 what is treatment provoked is also very important this is also why you will see in this um, uh, talk that I talk both about disease trajectories, but also about treatment or prescription trajectories, where we would like to follow the systematics in the drugs that that um, patients uh, receive. And of course, there is a lot of work also going on now for finding biomarkers that can sort of understand some of these um, uh, longitudinal processes. And again, there, there is a big difference often between, um, uh, for example, genetic signals that will give you a disease risk and those signals that actually determine how fast you uh, progress. 
so progression variation uh, is also uh, important and, and, and to try to separate that from, from the basic uh, disease risk. But of course, a lot of environmental um, influence, including the drugs uh, on these uh, trajectories when we go into to disease uh, space. So, uh, as you also heard from, from Jesper, I mean, we're interested in mechanisms. I will not talk so much about them in this talk, but uh, of course, we would like to, to look at the diseases to the right and the comorbidities and how diseases combine. But we're interested in finding the molecular reasons and the networks behind the disease uh, progression. And there, I usually also say that, that, that with the Human Genome Project that started in, in 89, I mean, the, the hope was that we could go bottom up and say, uh, now we look at some genetic variants to the left. Uh, and then we would be able to dis, uh, to predict the, the diseases that an individual would, would get. And, and this has not been very uh, successful. There's a lot of heterogeneity and also how diseases combine and, and what is actually progression patterns uh, versus just disease co-occurrence. Um, it's only in, in the more recent years that people have worked on that. So we need to get both sides of this figure in, in order. We need to prepare uh, the longitudinal patterns to to the right, and and then we could look for for biomarkers. This is this is the um, idea. But I will not talk talk much about that. I will show this other slide that I often also show in in um, in, in in talks. It's not from our own work, but this illustrates how many uh, human genes people thought the human genome would contain. So we have time on the x-axis, and we have the number of of genes. Uh, on the uh, y-axis. And if you look down there at 1960, people thought we would have around 7 million genes. Uh, and that was before the discovery of, of exons and, and introns. So people thought human genes were short, like in bacteria. Uh, now we know that they are longer and they, they, they are much fewer and they cover maybe 30, 40% of the entire genome. But but it was quite remarkable that, that even the back of the envelope calculations uh, when the Human Genome Project started uh, sort of estimated 150,000 genes and, and, and 100,000 genes. But, but as the uh, Human Genome Project progressed, we, we, we sort of uh, down at, at, at close to 20,000 genes. So, so we have uh, much fewer genes than we had anticipated. And this, of course, also means that that um, presumably many genes are involved in more than, than one disease. And we have a lot of pleiotropy that also relates to the disease core occurrence that we see in, in patients and in the, the, um, the, the clinic. But back to the trajectories, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite simple what we want. Uh, we would like to stratify patients according to longitudinal patterns. So each dot here is a diagnosis and, and uh, we might have the same um, uh, diagnosis to the right is actually from a paper on sepsis that I will not go through, but where we found three different routes towards se sepsis that actually uh, were uh, widely different in terms of, of the risk of, of, of dying from sepsis. But, but that's the basic idea in our work. We would like to not uh, sort of make case control in the sense that one diagnosis versus um, uh, not that diagnosis, but try to to find these longitudinal patterns. And uh, as I also said, we can do this at the level of diagnosis. We can do it at the level of, of drugs and prescriptions. We're also making lab test uh, trajectories, and and we're also doing quite a bit of text mining on millions of patient records and 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 try to see what we can find of longitudinal patterns there, and I will not talk so so much about, about that. I will get back to the the prescription trajectories, but first I will just show a few slides on the on, on the disease trajectories uh, that we have done over the past uh, couple of years. But of course, uh, taking this to the prescription level where we have analyzed more than one billion uh, prescriptions in, in the uh, Danish National Prescription Registry uh, is interesting. So, so, so first, I just touch a little bit uh, on, on more on, on the disease um, uh, trajectories. You already see, saw this one, but what we did now we sophisticated it somewhat, but what we did in this paper that we published in 2014 was to develop a quite simple approach that deals 
with the combinatorial explosion. Of course, when you have, say, uh, 1,200 or 1,400 uh, level 3 ICD-10 codes, then, of course, you have many possible uh, trajectories. So we sort of uh, made a quite simple statistical approach. Now it's a little bit more complicated, but but that approach identifies pairs of diagnoses where you have a statistically significant direction. So you have more patients going from N40 to C to C661 than the other way around. So we make these linear trajectories. You see four of them here, and then we can also summarize those as, as, a, as a graph where we, for example, add the number of patients that follow a, one of these uh, steps um, by the thickness, thickness of, of the air. So, so the basic idea is, is, is quite simple. And now we have actually made quite many papers. This is from un unpublished work. We are working on, on depression and you see in the mid middle uh, depressive episode and you see a recurrent depressive episode in green later there. And, and of course, in, in this kind of, of analysis uh, where you summarize a lot of linear uh, trajectories, you see the sort of complexity of some of these uh, phenotypes. But the idea is, of, and, and the hope is also, that maybe the past can be used to uh, predict where the uh, patients uh, will end up in terms of, of outcome or whether uh, this can be used to, to differentiate between the optimal treatment for, for subgroups in, in, the, um, uh, in, in this particular disease area. Here's another one for, for, for epilepsy that where we work with, with, with the Kidemos at, at Risk Hospital on, on uh, discriminating between focal epilepsy and, and generalized uh, epilepsy and also do a lot of, of um, drug uh, analysis in that context. We also um, uh, last year, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, last year, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, two years ago, published a paper on, on, on uh, sex specific disease uh, trajectories. And, and uh, uh, if you're interested in that, I can refer you to this um, paper. So all these transition probability for hopping between different chapters in ICD, uh, we, we tried to, to um, highlight all the, the differences for the diagnosis that both sexes can get. So no ovarian cancer or prostate cancer in, in, in this one. But 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 uh, I will not go into detail with that. I just skip this one. But I would like to point at a paper we published uh, last year that um, releases um, a um, disease trajectory browser where you can um, uh, interrogate the um, uh, ICD-10 period data. So, so data from 7.2 million uh, people. You basically plug in some codes and then um, the tool will will take uh, all the statistically significant uh, pairs out and stitch them together. And you can also enhance, uh, you know, crank up the relative risk, and then some of them will disappear. And you can you can um, quickly get an overview over how is the disease progression uh, patterns um, sort of looking like in, in Denmark. So this is not, again, disease co-occurrence, just it's, it's sort of statistically significant uh, directional forward going patterns. And you can, you can check um, all kinds of, 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 of details. So this is just summary level data. So there is no, no um, person sensitive, sensitive data in the the uh, the uh, browser, but I would like to mention this 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 tool and and uh, I mean you just choose a disease as linear trajectories for Down syndrome, but um, but you can choose and then uh, you can see whether there are statistically significant uh, directional patterns around the disease that you work on, and then you can might compare to Swedish data or Norwegian data or UK data or American data, and of course we should. Uh, also remember that the genetics is not the same and the healthcare system is not the same. So we are not necessarily expecting that all longitudinal patterns will 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 replicate. So um, I will go next here to to uh, some of the uh, recent work we have done on on uh, polypharmacy and analyzing uh, patterns in in uh, prescription, and uh, we have both looked at. Uh, dosages, um, um, and uh, we have also looked at, at at just the sort of order uh, in which you get your, your your prescriptions. But that's of course a growing problem because we have more and more 
uh, multi morbidities in, 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 in people, and we would like to understand which drugs uh, have drug drug interactions and, and, and uh, which can uh, be given to, um, to, uh, together. And the polypharmacy has, at least in some cases, just been addressed by counting. Uh, you say it's bad with more than six or 11 or whatever drugs, but our ambition was to try to say, okay, these 11 drugs are okay together, but these three are not. And of course, this is also inherent in a lot of, 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 of trial work and so on, but we tried to go into that using uh, raw patient record data where we would have the the dosage information uh, for, uh, ready for, for, for analysis. So we have one a project called the Big Time Health Project, where where we uh, actually have data from the two eastern Danish regions, where we have 2.7 million uh, patients, uh, followed over 10 years from 2006 to, to uh, 2016. So that's our data set where we have all the lab values, all the prescriptions, um, actually also permission to, to all the images and, 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 and sort of the deep phenotype that you can get out of, of, of patient records. And, and uh, for technical reasons, um, we have uh, in this project where we look at, at um, uh, dosages focused on a, on a data set from the capital region uh, only, uh, where we have one million um, uh, patients and 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 uh, around 25 million drug prescriptions, and you see how they are linked to the uh, ICD chapters down here to the to the right, and 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 you also see a statistics on on um, how the polypharmacy situation look like um, as a function of of age that is as expected and and described previously in the literature. Uh, you can also look at uh, before you go into analyzing how drugs are prescribed together just to see what uh, what are the sort of no number of of, of uh, co um, medications and the number of patients and and you see the the different atc and here of course i switched to to atc in my uh, color code coding i think i left out the the slide on on um, um on on that uh, color color coding but um uh, but 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 this is again illustrating across the the ATC groups uh, how how um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, the pre how the prevalence of, of therapeutic groups is and and um, and and the more prevalent the more it's 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 co-administered um, and this is from a paper that Christina Leal uh, have made uh, she just defended her PhD and the paper has has been submitted and is in, in review. So what she, what she really did was to get into uh, sort of a, a quite compli uh, complicated model for, for um, defining dosage changes. Of course, you have several drugs. In this case, you have three different um, uh, drugs and, and, uh, and then some of them change do dosage um, and you see the color is changed and the color is indicating the dosages. So, so she developed a model for how actually to follow all these dosage changes and and uh, then later possibly seeing how how these dosage changes um, correlate with known uh, drug drug uh, interactions and and in this data set um, 185 million treatment episodes were were um, um, uh, defined and uh, it led to uh, due to statistical re reasons and also uh, not not uh, uh, sufficient uh, monotherapy uh, episodes. I mean, we couldn't look across all uh, 1,500 drugs in the data set, but it ended up with 413 and then a lot of co-medication uh, drugs. So a lot of, 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 of pairs. I will skip some of the details in, 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 in this. But the idea in her work here was to say, okay, we have an index drug and then it is um, uh, prescribed together with other drugs. And you see the statistics here from, from these 1 million uh, patients. So you see a lot of index drugs. Uh, and then you see the ATC code breakdown uh, to the right. And it's fairly homogeneous across the drugs, how many you, you have from the nervous system and how, how many, many you have from the cardiovascular system and so on. There's some variation. But, 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 but when you look at at uh, drugs where 
the dosages are changing a lot. So the, the dosage of the index drug is changing a lot when when the or changing in a statistically significant uh, manner um, across the the um, uh, different ATC groups. You see much more uh, variation, and there is a tendency, for example, for for drugs to change a lot when they are. Uh, co-medicated uh, or, or co-prescribed with, with drugs from the from the same HCC group. So what came out of this was that this uh, data set of 80,000 co-medication pairs uh, went down to around 4,000. Uh, so these are the ones that 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 uh, Christina uh, analyzed in 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 more 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 uh, more detail. So um, um, so for example, I could maybe point here at other nervous system drugs here in 07 you see then then suddenly when pre, uh, co-prescribed with with um, um, uh, with, with other uh, uh, group uh, in drugs here uh, there's there's much more uh, variation and you can see the the, the same down here for psycho um, psychoanalytics uh, that 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 um, suddenly the end uh, but but there's of course a lot of, of, of details in 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 that so one of the results of uh, this work uh, was to to um, to try to see all those 4000 pairs here that that tend to to be changing a lot in terms of dosage uh, how many of those would correspond to uh, known drug-drug uh, interactions, including uh, uh, drugs mentioned in the Danish um, interaction database, but also uh, other databases. So we have actually now put together 25 uh, different DDI databases, and and um, in this work, 15 of them was uh, were 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 used. And it was interesting that that for these 4,000 pairs, 83% um, of them corresponded to known drug drug um, inter interaction. So so out of these 309 drugs that survived this analysis, 287. Uh, uh, and then their their co-medications um, corresponded to known uh, DDIs, and and then of course we have 17% left, and one possibility is that that these are are representing um, uh, unknown, um, uh, yet unknown drug drug um, interactions. And um, so what Christina did here was to, for example, look at at uh, the patient volumes and uh, actually um, uh, correct, as you can see in the first box plot down here. I mean the the um, uh, the 17 percent uh, lower lower patient uh, volume. Also, we did quite a lot of text mining of uh, 15 million full text papers. So not just abstract, but actually full text papers, and they were co-mentioned uh, these co-medication pairs less in the literature. Um, and um, they also had higher odds ratios. So, so this point in the direction that that I mean, these are maybe uh, unnoticed because of the lower patient volumes, and and um, uh, and therefore they are observed uh, less. Um, but this is of course just speculation. But but it sort of illustrates how an analysis of systematic dosage changes can point you uh, in direction of, of potential undiscovered uh, drug drug um, interactions but but why did we do all this work also it is of course because we want to to look at the uh, adverse events and the adverse uh, drug reactions so so we did already some years ago uh, publish a study on on the uh, Sankt Hans uh, mental center uh, Sankt Hans uh, patient records where we where we actually uh, mind uh, all the um, adverse effects that are mentioned on the Danish SPCs. Um, 
uh, some of your product uh, characteristics. So you see here increased weight. So this is, of course, in, in, in Danish here, but you see in yellow the, the adverse uh, events um, and sweating at night and, and, and so on. So we have this text mining uh, approach that we actually uh, described in a paper on drug safety some, some years ago, where we only used it for monotherapy. So we mined all these SBCs and, 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 and pooled the 21,000 adverse drug reactions mentioned there uh, from all the commercially available uh, drugs um, in, 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 um, in Denmark. And, and, and this workflow was then used to find uh, possible adverse drug reactions mentioned in the text of the record. And then, of course, it has to, to fit that the drug is, is prescribed in that period, but also that you don't see the same symptoms uh, before the prescription starts. But this was a workflow we made for, for monotherapy, and now we are changing that to the polypharmacy situation. And then it would be interesting to, to then characterize all these co-medication pairs uh, according to the um, adverse drug reactions that we actually see in the records, because we have, of course, a problem worldwide that, um, that we are not having a systematic uh, recording of, of many of the milder uh, adverse drug reactions. They are hidden in the text. They are hidden indirectly and implicitly in the in the lab values and so on. So if we want to link uh, the um, the polypharmacy to the uh, adverse drug reactions in the in the text, uh, we need to 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 go into the uh, text. And of course, also if we would like to link this later to 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 genetics. Um, then we need to do this exercise of actually uh, in a, in a, at the individual level, um, individual patient level, we need to extract the putative um, uh, potential um, um, uh, adverse events and then try to, to make the analysis. But we have not done that yet and Christina didn't get to make that in, in her thesis, but this is the, the idea. So uh, next, I would like to to um, also describe briefly some other unpublished work that we have done on the prescription registry that I mentioned in the uh, in the beginning. Um, uh, so 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 this work, uh, of course, uh, is carried out on on the dosage change work is carried out on on, on real patient records. So now we are moving moving back to a, um, a prescription uh, registry. So we simply took the Danish prescription registry and, and analyzed um, uh, nearly 25 years of, of, of um, data. Uh, these uh, 1.1 billion observations and and uh, see what, what how, how are people sort of moving around in the ATC uh, space and and. Um, uh, how does it look when you look at the entire registry? Of course, the registry has been used for a lot of analysis that have been more um, drug specific. Here we are just making a drug ag agnostic analysis of, of, of all the um, of all the um, um, sort of uh, correlations that we find. And, and again, you can make statistics as you saw for the patient registry. You, you take the lower panel here. We see ATC group counts as a function of age. We say males and, and females, and you see we get a lot of drugs when we are babies are very young, and then it goes away, and then we see some differences that are well known between the males and 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 uh, and females in terms of of um, drug uh, use. So again, we we need to deal with this combinatorial explosion. Um, so we break it down to drug pairs and, and, and make an analysis of how one drug increases the uh, likelihood that you will get another uh, drug. Uh, and um, I skip some of these details, but of course you, you could um, analyze this from the perspective of, of um, drug pairs that are, are going across uh, different HCC classes. Uh, you can also uh, work uh, with the same uh, HCC class and, and maybe look into how people shift from first line treatment to second line treatment and, and, and third line treatment and maybe uh, potentially find out that there would be groups of patients who actually should start on second line treatment. So this is one of the aims in this 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 project. And, and the, the um, general result is sort of 
um, illustrated here, uh, quite boring in many ways. We take all these 1.1 billion prescriptions and then we find out uh, which are the uh, statistically significant trajectories that we observe in this uh, uh, space. And, and if you set a threshold of, of 1,000 patients that should follow these trajectories hopping from, from one uh, drug group to, to another. Um, Alejandro uh, Orocho, who, who did this work, he, he found 9 million of them. And that's, of course, then a basis for, for more um, targeted or specific uh, analysis. But this is one way to discriminate between uh, what is just 1 billion uh, trajectories and what is actually uh, statistically significant um, longitudinal patterns in the prescriptions and actually uh, there was quite a compression when you go from from one billion down to to nine nine million but we uh, in this paper we go into to this issue of, of um, uh, whether we can we can see uh, whether it would be a good idea uh, for example in hypertension uh, to um, uh, to or where we can spot the groups that maybe should start on second line treatment or third line treatment instead of first line treatment. So we compare um, um, ACE inhibitors here to uh, ARBs, and 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 here you just see the trajectory network uh, for for this specific uh, group, and. Um, and um, I mean, what we discovered when you compare uh, ACE to ARB and, and, and you compare four groups. So here we have patients who actually stay on, on um, ACE. So we have on this figure here years after the first uh, RAS uh, prescription here, and you have the survival probability of the y-axis. Um, when you compare these four groups staying on ACE, uh, staying on ARB, um, uh, change to ARB from ACE or, or the other way around, then there's quite a bit of, of um, a difference in the um, uh, mortality. So there could be an idea in actually finding out should actually some of these um, be prescribed in, in a different way or should they be, be checked uh, for possible uh, change in, in, the, in the prescription. Actually, the the numbers here for hypertension, of course, quite high, ACE, uh, 550,000 and so on. So, so the statistics is, is, um, is quite uh, good. So we actually took this uh, example and, and looked into the UK Biobank. And as you know, it's not 7.2 million people. It's, um, it's 500,000 people. So, so here we are down to, to 50,000. But um, um, uh, so the statistics is not as good, but we see the exactly the same uh, sort of ranking in the um, survival probabilities. And, and, and uh, we also go into other examples, but this is the idea. And what we also do in the paper that I will not have time to go into is actually to, to turn this into a um, prediction approach or, or a treatment plan recommendation approach where we where we take the prior trajectories of the patients. So in this case, it's it's uh, patients treated with ACE and pa patients treated with ACE and then changed to RRB. So we can make sort of a, a patient like me approach where we com compare a new group, uh, a new patient with these four groups, and then we can can uh, suggest what the the patient should um, should actually uh, be be um, uh, be recommended and and or what the physician should be recommended to recommend to the patient. Of course, this kind of approach should then go into a trial to see if it if it actually works. But but in this retrospective analysis, we can actually see the same pattern in the Danish data and the UK biobank uh, data, and of course also in the UK biobank data and also in the Danish data, we can go into genetics, but I will also not have time to to, uh, to go into that. But that's that's the um, that's the idea. And this is of course then now uh, GP data uh, in the prescription registry. So you've seen one example for the hospital data and also one example for, for the um, uh, uh, for the GP data, and of course, uh, optimally they should they should be put, put together. And we also work. So I'll just mention here in the end one 
uh, example where we more actively use these um, um, disease trajectory for, for prediction. I mean, you saw in the previous examples that we have a, a model where we use the prescription trajectory for, for um, uh, prediction, and I didn't show you the results in, in detail, but it's actually quite successful. But, but it's not published yet. I mean, here we, we, we switch to intensive care data. That's really a big data uh, sort of area. Uh, and and um, in a paper that we published a few years ago, we tried to use the uh, disease trajectory of a single patient uh, for a mortality prediction of that particular patient. We are not so good in Denmark at actually using our red registries uh, in, in, in the treatment and the bedside situation. I think we could do much more of, of, um, of that. But the idea is quite simple here. We want to predict survival, 30 day survival, for example. And then we take the disease trajectory and plug it into an old school neural network, very simple um, perceptron that I also used in the 80s in my, my work. So no, nothing sophisticated there. Uh, trajectory to the left and then lab values and, and um, uh, vitals and so on to the right. So, so, so the data uh, to the right, they come from a 24 hour um, data collection uh, and, and then of course the disease trajectory could come from 15 or, or 20 years. So here we are really aggregating time scale and this is of course uh, time scales and, and this is of course interesting. What, what, what is most powerful, the data that you have after 25 hours following uh, admission or, or the the the, uh, the trajectory and um, uh, so it's illustrated here so you can do this in in various ways you can look at the history before admission you can look at the history at admission and you can look at the aggregated history uh, you could also look at at the performance of the uh, subs 2 score that normally is computed from these values that you have after 24 hours and you can also look at apache and so on other survival scores but it's quite interesting that that in this simple analysis if you take the blue one that's subs 2 so that's the performance in terms of mortality prediction that you can get uh, from these data, from the vitals and the lab values and so on, in this correlation coefficient that we um, so, um, use here, 0.325. So the mortality is very high in this type of patients. So this is why it, um, it's also harder to predict. But if you take the orange one, you see that that is actually uh, quite a bit better. So. So using the disease history at admission, you actually outperform what is known, uh, what can be known um, uh, after 24 hours. But when you put them together in the green, where you use the, the all the data uh, here, uh, then of course you you get the best uh, the best of, of, of two worlds, and then you get a better um, prediction. And that's the point here. There's actually a lot of power in the and predictive performance hidden in these disease trajectories. So they they presumably can be used much more at the n equal to one single patient level. Uh, so so the statistics you see to the left is. Um, um, for all the patients, and I will not go through the data set, it was um, uh, 12,000 ICU um, patients, a lot of detail in that, but but if you, for example, uh, break it down into sepsis patients and uh, respiratory insufficiency patients, you see, for example, for sepsis, uh, I mean, the SUBS2 score is really bad, and the history at admission or, or before admission really outperforms uh, uh, SUBS2 for respiratory patients. It's it's uh, it's still being outperformed, but 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 it's it's more powerful. Um, so 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 this sort of illustrates um, how these longitudinal um, um, uh, trajectory data can be used for for a single uh, patient. You can also go into explaining features with these machine learning algorithms, which features are important and not surprisingly for intensive care patients, age is very important, lengths of hospital stay and so on. There's a lot of details in this. We also found some some new um, uh, features here that, that I will not have time to describe, but if you, for example, have a high age, uh, so that means orange dot up here, um, then of course it's not so strange that you are getting drawn towards uh, non-survival. But then when you look at, at how the age interacts with other 
um, uh, features, for example, metastatic cancer, then you will actually be drawn the other way. So, so, um, uh, so there are some of these interactions that the machine learning approach picks up that 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 also are very interesting, and also we found some new diagnoses uh, there. But but getting into explaining the network and what features are important is, of course, also important. What in the past was actually important, and I, I just flash. Uh, a newer paper from last year where we're sort of not just making a prediction after 24 hours. This is um, Hans Christian Thorsen Meyer who, who did it sort of uh, a, a, a more uh, deep learning approach where, where there, there will be a predip, uh, prediction every hour. And actually, he can explain the network every hour, what features are drawing the patient towards death and, and what features uh, are drawing the patient um, towards survival. Actually, this patient here will, will, will um, uh, survive. Uh, but it, it again sort of illustrates how the, the longitudinal analysis can, can, can be done. So um, uh, I will finish now and, and, and be happy to answer uh, questions. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to look at longitudinal patterns in, in general, whether it's diagnosis, whether it's prescription, whether it's, it's dosages. And of course, I've not talked about lab value trajectories or, or text-based uh, trajectories, but, but that's the idea in our work and, and possibly also redefine some phenotypes uh, as trajectories that could be more mechanistic. Maybe the three sepsis trajectories that you saw uh, in the beginning of the talk, maybe they represent three different mechanisms and maybe they should be treated also uh, in, 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 um, in different uh, ways. And we are doing a lot of trajectory analysis in a, in a large number of of diseases where we try to find the the subgroups that actually maybe uh, reflect different etiologies or uh, mixed etiologies. We work, for example, in dementia, where we published a paper last year in in, in Alzheimer's and dementia, where we also could could uh, see that that maybe several many more patients than previously anticipated would have Alzheimer and vascular dementia at the same time. So co competing etiologies for, for, for um, the same sort of uh, phenotype in many ways. Uh, so we're interested in that. But of course, I'm not talking much here about uh, diet, uh, genetics, uh, socioeconomic data. Uh, we are working on, on, on smart meter data that also tell you something about how people uh, behave and so on. So there are many data types that you can add to this type of longitudinal uh, analysis. This is just the beginning. And I think many other groups are, of course, also uh, working on, on, on these disease progression patterns using some of these uh, thoughts that we, uh, that we also have been, been working on. So here's my, my group and, and uh, thanks to many of the names here and the funders. Uh, and again, uh, thanks a lot for your your attention here and for the invitation and hope there will be time for answering some questions. Well, thank you, sir, for a magnificent walkthrough of some of the uh, big data power um, that is being unleashed and, and especially since as all of this is happening uh, in, in within the past 10 years, it's just amazing to watch uh, some of the results here. Um, there were a couple of questions coming through that I just wanted to make sure that we, we do cover and I can see a lot of applause coming through. It's, it's really a tour de force, really appreciate it. Um, and that is asking how change in treatment possibilities, new drugs and treatment uh, regimes taking over 24 years of time. Um, how is change in treatment possibilities, new drugs and treatment re regimes taken in over 24 years of time? So how did you account for that over the 24 years? I mean, that's it's like... That's a lot of changes uh, yeah. over those years, right? Uh, that that is a really good point. And if you look into diabetes, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if you take the ICD-8 period, of course the treatment options were different. Um, uh, now I didn't uh, present any work, including that period here. But we actually have a project where we try to compare the the uh, trajectories that are statistically significant in the ICD-8 period and those from the uh, ICD-10. So, so I, I mean, the point is, is really uh, important, but you can also use it actively when you take GLP-1 and so on. How, how did it actually change the trajectory? So there's no doubt that, that new treatment possibilities are changing 
some of these statistically significant um, uh, pairs, um, and uh, even for I mean COVID nineteen, I mean the the temporal uh, properties are of course different uh, today than they were one and a half years ago, and so on. So this is a good point, but I think you you can still use the approach to compare uh, different time periods and then also see the the effect of of, of new treatments. But it's more recently that we. Uh, started working on the drugs, and now we will actually uh, go into that question a little bit more. Cool. And Paul is asking, are the clusters seen in sepsis patients uh, regarding severity of outcome applicable, uh, i.e. the three trajectories? Um, uh, and then he comes, uh, which is, by the way, Paul is one of our magnificent statisticians here, and he, he points to the fact that statisticians are extremely wary of clustering. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit to that. I, I think we're getting into some of the classic <laughs> debates. But uh. Uh, so, so now I didn't uh, really present the paper. It's a paper from 2016, and actually the reference should have been um, out here. It's Mette Beck, uh, who Mette Ledeman, Mette Beck Ledeman, uh, who actually did this work. I mean, she was wondering that if you looked into the li literature, what was the impact of diabetes? I mean, you see the pink diagnosis here. This is uh, endocrinology. And uh, so some papers said that, that diabetes would increase your risk of dying from sepsis, and other papers said that it was the other way around. And actually, what 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 is uh, what did come out of this paper was that actually by stratifying the patients in this way, so the middle one actually these guys have diabetes, but they also have cancer. Then she could sort of rationalize why the um, uh, why the relative risks were so different in different papers. Uh, so so I just recommend the the 2016 uh, scientific reports paper. It's actually now becoming more and more cited because people can see that these actually represent some um, some information that is uh, relevant uh, in in actionable uh, sense. I guess uh, intensivists they know a lot about uh, this, but here it's uh, systemat uh, systematized, and you can look at the statistics and and see whether you can. Uh, find ways to improve it. I wouldn't say that it's perfect, but we're finding ways to improve it. Fantastic. And um, you did mention that you you brought in the UK Biobank to reproduce some of the results. Have you done more work about reproducibility across borders, kind of validation of some of your findings? What I mean, what does the landscape look like for that at the moment? Yeah, I mean, uh, what we see, I guess, is uh, just get this the same pattern, right? Um, yeah. uh, and of course, the, the, we have had these data now for quite uh, many years, uh, and, and, and we work with data from the Danish blood donor study and also the Copenhagen Hospital Biobank, and, and we can see whether we can uh, replicate. But I guess that's, that's the key problem. We have some Nordic projects where we are funded to compare what we see in the genetic data from Denmark, mm -hmm. in Norway or Iceland, and then I would also mention the uh, One Million uh, Genomes project that um, uh, finally Denmark joined. That uh, project, we had been an observer. And, and again, in this project, people thought that we would take all the Danish genomes and put them at some European supercomputer. But, but it, is, it is a federation approach where the genomes stay in Denmark, they stay in the National Genome Center. But then they can actually be be analyzed in the same way if you get the right permission. So, so this this um, uh, uh, idea of having a federation approach uh, where you do not move data but you move the algorithm around. That is uh, at least um, security wise and also legally feasible. Um, so, so that's the development we mm. we see because we all. Uh, need need replication of our results, and especially in a small country like like Denmark. Even if we have more to be proud of now, I would say that uh, at least for some years we were behind on the whole genome sequencing in Denmark uh, in in many ways. But it's looking better now, and 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 we need these datasets from the other countries to uh, uh, to see and check up on on the patterns we 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 see, and also in pharmacogenomics. I mean, I think that. Um, that is a low-hanging fruit, obviously, sure. if you can get the side effects out and you can find the 
the variant that uh, provoke uh, that uh, side effect, then then it's it's uh, very important to mm. check it up against. I definitely do expect that also with European health data space, new technologies will have to be applied in order to access data in different countries, but also the ability where you may be able to go wide in certain countries and deep in other countries potentially could be complementary to each other, right? So yeah. you may not necessarily need genetics everywhere, but you would definitely need a lot of data in order to then go and look at some of those specific genetic patterns. Um, I, I see Nana had a question. Nana, do you want to say that yourself? I think you raised your hand. Yes, if it's possible, I would like to ask a Please question. Do. Yep. Thank you for a very um, a great talk. So actually, I was interested in this figure that you showed because uh, um, Actually, you can see there's, there's no difference in mortality whether you whether you change from uh, uh, one RAS to another RAS. But actually, if you stay on the same uh, same treatment, your mortality is higher. So I was wondering whether you have do you have any data on, for example, healthcare seeking behavior or because this could be a, a a result in that. And also the data you showed about the intensive care unit um you know people uh, re uh, getting or patients getting referred to the intensive care unit there there's always a decision behind it from the intensive care specialist so uh, there might be other things than just the patient uh, uh, or the values or the if the yeah the the disease uh, of the, the patient disease uh, uh, that's um, dependent on whether they get to the intensive care unit but also the decision by the by the physician himself or herself so yeah no th these are, are are good points and and um, of course uh, this particular figure if you take the danish version of it uh, of course th this is gp uh, data so so we optimally we would uh, really need the gp records in order to see whether these would be patients who are checked up on less frequently or what is going on and 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 we also look to ulses register uh, now um, to to follow up on some of these things but of course we we are not really in a good position for example text mining um, the gp records in denmark as you see for example in in the uk um, uh, so we have some possibilities for following up and maybe see what what is actually the either socioeconomic or, or or sort of follow up um, aspect uh, to to this also very important because this is I wouldn't call it a confounding factors but factor but it's more uh, possibly a cause right uh, that they are not shifted over to the alternative treatment but this is a really uh, really good um, point um, and and for the intensive care um, uh, project. So, so this is a project done together with with Anna's Perna, um, and um, um, so so it's actually part of this Big Temp Health project where we had an intensive care component. And people, when we got the grant um, five six years ago, people thought it would be it was a little bit strange. But now, I guess um, ICU data analysis has become a little bit more fashionable but but um, we go into some of these things because we we um, uh, we couldn't publish the paper in Lancet Digital unless we replicated the result in um, in a different region so we got re uh, data from region south uh, they used the same ICU um, database uh, that was used in in in, um, in the capital region before SP uh, so, so there were some advantages um, uh, there. So, but but you can look in in, in the second paper um, for some of these um, uh, issues. And of course, uh, also uh, Hans Christian, uh, he's an intensivist and and um, uh, consultant in this area. So he actually started on his PhD after um, being specialist. Um, so, so they are of course uh, aware of all these. Uh, um, decisions that are taken together with family and all that uh, and 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 we come on part of that in the in the um, in the paper so i i would say that uh, that this has been sort of incorporated in the approach but of course there are confounding factors that you cannot um, necessarily exclude but but i think the idea of 
of, of, of giving an explainable and an explained network every hour gives the physician an opportunity to say, okay, now this feature seems to be much more important, so we change the treatment again. Uh, if it should be implemented, of course, there should be a trial, and and uh, and and this is what Anas Perna is expert in. So I will leave that uh, part to him. Thank you. Well, Sam, thank you so much for uh, truly a uh, fast uh, browse through uh, seven to ten million uh, Danes uh, kind of healthcare data. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll see a lot of more interesting stuff coming from you and your group. So really looking forward to that. Um, definitely food for thought of moving in some of the big data analytics also within the regulatory space. So uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, thank you to all of you who, uh, who joined in today to listen. Um, and uh, hope to see you around soon again. Thanks. Thank thanks to you all also for the nice questions. Thank you.